viewers, and welcome to AAU Talks on AAU TV, the primary higher education television network in Africa. Today, we are going to discuss higher education issues in the Sudan. I will be your sitting host. My name is Ransford Bequin, and we have with us one of the vice chancellors of the universities in Sudan. But before I introduce him, Please follow us on our social media handles and on Twitter at AAU underscore 67. Let's go for a short break and when we come back, I'll introduce the guest. جامعة السودان العالمية تهنئ الطلاب الناجحين في الشهادة السودانية وتتمنى لهم النجاح في دراساتهم الجامعية وتدعوهم للتعرف على برامجها المتميزة في تخصصات بكالوريوس الطب والجراحة بكالوريوس طب الأسنان بكالوريوس الشرف في الصيدلة بكالوريوس المختبرات الطبية بكالوريوس علوم التمريض بكالوريوس الشرف في الهندسة بكالوريوس الشرف في الحوسبة ونظم المعلومات بكالوريوس الشرف في العلوم الإدارية بكالوريوس الشرف في الاقتصاد والدراسات المالية والمصرفية بكالوريوس الشرف في السياحة وإدارة الفنادق جامعة السودان العالمية قومية التوجه عالمية التطلع Welcome back viewers to AAU Talks on AAU TV. Before the break, I had introduced a topic for the day, discussing higher education issues in the Sudan. And I have with me here one of the vice chancellors of the universities in Sudan. He is also the AAU board member for the Eastern African sub-region. With me here to discuss the topic is Professor Bakri Osman Said, President of Sudan International University. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. How are you, Prof? I'm, I'm good uh, since you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, welcome to Sudan. I wish you a good stay. I'm very grateful to you for making the long journey. Yeah, thank you from very Accra. much. And I hope you enjoy being with us here in Khartoum. I uh, haven't regretted at all. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you. Very good. And your university is a private university? It is a private university established in 1990 okay. and by a group of investors from Sudan and Saudi Arabia. And um, however, it, it took a few years before it started taking students. Mm. And now uh, we have around 13,000 students. 13, that's quite yeah, a number. Yeah, that's right. With 10 faculties, mm. uh, some of them offering up to five, uh, five uh, programs. Okay. Uh, and covering all the areas, uh, the medical engineering areas and humanities uh, as well. And the university is located in three campuses. Okay. This is actually the smallest of them, but it's the nearest to the city center. Okay. Um, and uh, so although it was established as a private university, but it was uh, with the social objective mm. in terms of scholarships and uh, service to the society, okay. uh, corporate responsibility and, and oh. those issues. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good concept on which the university is, okay. is based. Well, there, there is always a notion out there that private universities don't really branch into you know, traditional research or programs that are not market-oriented. They only want the quick ones, accounting, mm. you know, those that the graduates can easily find work. So well, I think you, you are generally right, uh, although having said that, if you look at education in a country like America, which is leading the world in education and technology and all that, uh, the, the most notable universities there are private universities. Many of them are... In America? Yeah, in America. Okay. Yeah, many of them are non-for-profit though. Okay. And they uh, enjoy a lot of uh, financial support and endowments from the business community and that. Mm. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but generally, uh, you, could, you could say so, is private universities are generally more market-oriented than public universities. Uh, having said that, uh, quite often, like if you look at my university, for example, we run a, a program on, on tourism and hotel management, okay. and it, it is running at a loss. 
is run yeah, at the Lord. Yeah, but we keep it because we, we think it's essential for this country. This country has got huge tourist potential, mm. which is not tapped into uh, so far. Mm. It has a very rich history. The ancient, uh, ancient Kush kingdom and that which coexisted with the Egyptian civilizations. It has desert, it has safari, has access to the Red Sea, mm. very rich marine life in our part of the, uh, of the Red Sea. And uh, we have the Nile, of course, and uh, the, the, the White Nile and the, the Blue Nile coming from Ethiopia, all meeting here in Khartoum. I hope you have a chance to look at the yes, confluence of the Nile before you go. Have you? Did you? Yes, I did. You did, right. OK. Yeah. And when you look at them, the White Nile is, is whitish and the blue is yeah, bluish. bluish. Yes. And, and when they meet, they go side by side for some distance yes. before so mixing. It's beautiful. So the birth of the Nile even starts from Khartoum. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. The, the river Nile starts from Khartoum. It takes a very long, tortuous journey mm -hmm. until the Mediterranean, yeah. uh, okay, through Egypt. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Prof, um, now tourism. Yes. Tourism here. You are running at a loss but the country has a huge potential. The country has a huge potential so and people are just beginning to uh, realize this. Even our ancient civilization has always been overshadowed by the Egyptians. Yes. Because the initial scholars who studied the Egyptian civilization assumed that Northern Sudan historically was part of Egypt. Oh. And so okay. the whole thing was studied under the title of Egyptiology. And even in the, in the Louvre Museum in Paris, yes. which I visited about four times, I only noticed when I went last year, now they have changed some of the signs. And instead of saying, this was from Egypt, they put Sudan, Sudan. from Egypt and okay. Sudan, because they realized a lot of these actual archaeological remains were mm. in, f from Sudan. And in fact, even the pyramids, which the ancient Egypt history is famous for the pyramids, there are very strong hypotheses now by uh, well-known historians that uh, the initial pyramids were built in Sudan. Although the Sudanese pyramids were smaller, oh. but in number, there are more ancient pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt. Oh, we miss the likes of Ali Mansuri. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yes. uh, this, oh. is, this is true. Oh. So uh, all that has just been rediscovered now. Okay. And the, the, the discoveries are going on. Uh, now there are a lot of uh, Swiss and German expeditions with Sudanese uh, scholars uh, discovering new things, uh, new okay. temples, oh. new, new burial places for the, what they call them, the black pharaohs, okay. uh, the kings of those times, yes. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Uh, talking about tourism then brings back to mind the uh, strategic plan of education in the Sudan. Where is the focus on? Uh, well, uh, that's a strategic plan of education. Um, education went through b very different phases in Sudan because mm. initially uh, we had a, a, a condominium which is the joint rule of uh, Britain and Egypt of Sudan, and this was defeated by a Sudanese rebel, Al Mahdi, mm. uh, in uh, 1883. So they were thrown mm. out, and the British were very unhappy. So they sent a, an army led by Lord Kitchener. This is an, uh, Lord Kitchener is, is an army general who had a very long history, subsequently in South Africa, actually, okay. uh, where he was killed. And then at that time, so Sudan was ruled by General Gordon. John Gordon was a Scots general, and before coming to Sudan, he was based in China. Yeah. And the Chinese hold very bitter memories about the role of the English army then led by General Gordon. And General Gordon, then the Sudanese rebellion led by Al Mahdi, killed General Gordon in the, rep in the Republic Palace, which is still there. Okay. It's, it's very old. If you, if, you mm. if you drive by the Nile Street, mm you come there by the Republic Palace. Okay. And if, uh, if you happen to go there, uh, if you wave to the guards, they will return the, 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 yeah, they will, uh, the greetings by hitting their guns on the, on the floor. This is a very old tradition. Wow. So a lot of children, <laughs> when they come there in their parents' cars, they wave to the guards, yes, and the guards, they did the silent. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so what happened then, Lord Kitchener, 
uh, run down Sudanese armies and he, he retook Sudan for, well before that it was the, the, the Khedive actually, then the condominium rule came after the British occupied Khartoum. And then they started in 1902 okay. a school which became the University of Khartoum. Okay. And then he started acquiring different schools. The, the School of Medicine, for example, I started in 1923, yeah. and the School of Accounting and Business before that, uh, and, and so on. In 19, la later it became a college in the University of London. Yeah. And after independence, 1956, it became University of Khartoum. Okay. And then some years back, we added two universities, one in Jazeera State to the south of Khartoum, and then it was very slow. In 1989, we had big expansion in higher education. Okay. And some of the polytechnics were changed to universities. Right. Uh, and that expansion went on and continued. And there have been a lot of uh, uh, like, uh, concern among some scholars that the rapid expansion will uh, lead to dilution of academic standards mm. and that. So it was really a balance between increasing accessibility to higher education mm. by more people mm. uh, uh, or uh, uh, like sticking to few elitist, elitist, elitist yeah. institutions. Mm. And, 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 and this, uh, the, this argument continues to mm. be like sort of uh, mm. uh, thrown uh, by, by, some, by some people into, into the ring. So, uh, so, uh, right, now, um, a, a lot of uh, issues came into the expansion of higher education because different states kept putting pressure on the system to have their own universities okay. in the different states. And that led to further expansion of higher education. Mm. So, they have, we had several conferences which tried to work towards a unified like strategy for higher education, and uh, we now have a five-year plan, which okay. we are in the middle of the of first year of that. Okay. So, so there, are, uh, th there is a, a strategic plan. Okay. Some people uh, say that, um, well, some aspects of the plan are okay, are, are good. Some, some aspects are a bit like, or probably too ambitious. To achieve within five yeah. year time frame, mm. uh, but like anything else, we mm. will find out as we, 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 we go along. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the African Union has several initiatives. It has science, technology, innovation, strategic you know plans. It has the Continental Education Strategy for Africa, and the broader agenda 2063. Likewise, globally, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, etc. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the African Union, the focus has been on science, technology, engineering, mathematics, mm -hmm. and perhaps agriculture and um, um, health to the detriment of the arts. Do you subscribe to Africa shifting the focus from a broad uh, general education to using STEM? to propel the continent's development? It's a good question. Uh, after independence, uh, all African countries, the first thing they thought of is to expand on, in education because for them, uh, the development which was achieved in, the, in, in developed countries was done primarily through education because uh, traditionally, the economists will tell you about uh, for development you need the four pillars of land, labor, capital, but then and entrepreneurship. Exactly. When mm -hmm. education came, we had this leap which produced this wonderful civilization which we are enjoying. Yes. And so, um, all, almost all African countries they went into expanding on education. After years, when you look at the outcome of this endeavor, uh, you see, yes, there have been a lot of successes, but they are more uh, conspicuous in the area of, of, of applied sciences and, and, and medicine and that, mm -hmm. uh, because they produce a lot, a lot of uh, professionals and, and the society can see them that, okay, we have national teachers and doctors and engineers and things like that. And so even for the individual, if you, if you ask them about do you think universities are important? They will say yes, because 
the doctor who treats me graduates from an university and the engineer who's, bu who's built my house or the teacher who's teaching my son. <laughs> but if you say, what about the philosophy graduate? Yes. They will pause and, and think. Mm -hmm. Was it nearly important to spend money teaching people philosophy or sociology or history or, yeah. or whatever? So, and then a, a lot of people wanted their children to go and study medicine or engineering or accounting yeah. or business. Which because the private universities it, are now focusing on. Well, exactly, because of uh, employability mm -hmm. and the earnings. They earn more, they are e mo more easily employable than a, a graduate in, in, uh, okay, in, in, in pure science or in, in a language or anything like but, this. But so don't you think that this um, problem I mean, arises from the World Trade Organization. You know, they treat education now as a private good. Uh, it, it is true. I mean, uh, like uh, the, after the Uruguay Agreement, they now treat uh, services as commodities, yes. uh, including obviously education, education yeah. and all that. And, and that was necessitated by the by, by the the type of economy we live the the, the, the free economy we live in and people have always to cost things yes. uh, whatever you do have to to be costed and uh, even in developed countries education in, in the non like science or stem as you put it yeah. suffered a lot yeah. suffered a lot because of similar arguments okay. about Okay, we, we know we need more doctors, more engineers, more that. We are not sure if we need more philosophers or people, historians. People or are anything. killing the, themselves from social pressures, you know. When they cannot cope, you need a psychologist, you need a historian to tell us about more about cartoon yes. than any other place. Well, I agree not equally important. Yeah, I agree with you because I think that, that whatever you do is done within a certain cultural context. Okay. And uh, th those like non-science disciplines are the ones which have the tools mm. to explore for us okay. this cultural context mm. and then help us streamline our efforts and our resources okay. for maximum achievement. Okay. So uh, I agree with you, mm. but uh, it's very difficult nowadays to convince the societies to spend because the pressure now even the social pressure from families yes. is for more science and applied mm. uh, sort of uh, education. Mm. Yeah, but there, there still seems to be a challenge because for every plane that lands in Africa, you may have Asians, particularly Chinese, yeah. who are coming to take over some jobs that we are not doing. That leads to our lack of focus on technical and vocational education. But before you answer that, mm. let me just go for a quick break, and then we will answer that. Viewers, I'm talking to Professor Bakri Osman Said, who is the president of Sudan International University, and we are discussing higher education issues in the Sudan. Please stay tuned in. We are going for a short break. The University of Khartoum is the oldest university in Sudan. It has a lot of faculties, and this includes the science faculty. The science faculty has a lot of facilities and among them is the Microbial Culture Collection Unit, MCCU. The MCCU has two subunits, namely the Molecular Biology and the Microbiology Units. The Microbiology Units consist of the Culture Room and the Microbiology Lab. The Microbiology Lab is well equipped with state-of-the-art facilities to conduct analysis on bacteria and other microbes. The bacteria are then sent to the culture room for incubation based on two temperatures, that is the cold and the room temperature. There is also a freeze dryer that converts bacteria into powdery forms to be stored over time. The molecular biology unit is where DNAs are extracted using equipment such as microwaves. Other facilities of the unit include a sterilization room where all equipment used in the unit are sterilized. It is also where the microbes used in the various experiments are killed. A cold room where samples such as DNA and media are kept, as well as a meeting room where seminars and experiments are done. Welcome back viewers from the break. 
Before the break, I was discussing higher education issues in the Sudan with Professor Said, who is the president of Sudan International University and also one of the board members of the Association of African Universities. We are now going to shift the focus on technical and vocational education and training. Prof, in um, a country like Germany, mm. students who are opting for tertiary education mm. go to the technical universities. Mm. It's because of the background that they have. In Africa, less than 3% of tertiary enrollment are in technical and vocational education and training. Wherein lies the challenge? Uh, what you are saying is, is very true. I continue to be that people uh, see more prestige in acquiring academic qualifications rather than uh, vocational uh, training. And that, as you have mentioned correctly, has led to a lot of deficiency in the marketplace. And uh, it is true now when countries embark on big projects like which uh, uh, are funded and executed by these large companies from, uh, you mentioned China, and truly you are right, a lot of uh, uh, external uh, uh, activities like this are carried by Chinese companies. Uh, you don't find sufficient like uh, middle grade uh, vocationally trained people to fill in those gaps. And this is a chronic problem. Uh, and. Uh, uh, some countries have tried to legislate to improve mm. the status of those technical graduates of technical education mm. by positive discriminating uh, uh, for them uh, okay. in their favor, mm. uh, giving them higher pay and that sort of thing. Okay. And there was partial success because the social factors are still like, like very, very strong. Um, the economic situation usually plays a role here because when the economic situation is, is hard and tough, then financial issues start becoming more important and that might push some more people into this technical education. And in this country, in Sudan, what happened some years back, the most of these technical schools were changed into universities. Okay. And m many years afterwards, people realized uh, that uh, they, should, they probably shouldn't have done this. And now they're going back mm -hmm. to opening new technical colleges. Yeah. And they, are o they have opened the first technological university, completely technological, okay. which has colleges in different parts of the country. Okay. And one way people try to uh, 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 sort of fill the gap by trying to equate technical with academic education in, in, in the credentials, in the qualifications, by saying, okay, they will all have a bachelor's degree and they can all go for masters and PhDs. I myself, I never thought that was a good direction. Okay. Uh, it, it created a lot of, uh, because you don't tell people with vocational training that they are inferior and they should seek to get academic qualifications because you, you then take them out of the, their track. Uh, people should be proud of what they do and uh, people should know that without them, then it becomes very difficult really, really to build a lot of industries. And that's the way uh, things should go because now what we have, some of these uh, graduates with a bachelor's degree, uh, there are some conflict in the, in the workplace mm -hmm. about the division of labor, yeah. who does, who what? does what, uh, and so on. For example, the grade of nursing, we have two types of nurses now. Nurses who graduated with a diploma okay. and others who graduated with a bachelor's oh, degree. Bachelor's. And then the nurses who graduated with a bachelor's degree, they say, no, we are more, we are too qualified to do the mundane uh, uh, functions done by, uh, should be done by the diploma, the diploma nurses. There's a lot of conflict in the workplace because yeah. of that. Yeah. Because it's very difficult to, to divide the professional practice between <laughs> two categories yeah. of professionals. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm just giving this as an example. Okay. It's being repeated in other uh, areas, other spheres. Okay. So uh, I think uh, the deficiency in the technical education is very apparent mm. in, in, in Africa, mm. is, is even in developed countries now. Uh, Germany has been leading in Europe because they have taken 
technical education seriously okay. for a long time. Mm. And they've been working very hard mm. to build a niche for it in education and, va and build value in it, which convince the practitioners. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's profitable for people to go into that type of education mm. as well. So in, uh, in your um, estimation, is there any linkages between German universities and Sudanese universities in this area? Oh, there are four, four not, not many. They give some scholarships, okay. so not many. They, there was a conference of Sudanese German universities right. here in Khartoum last year. Okay. Uh, was okay at the start. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't say um, a lot come out of it, but at least there was some introduction to the German education system okay. and where people can link up to benefit from it. So I think a lot of work still needs to be mm. done uh, before we could start benefiting from the, 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 the special features of uh, German higher education. Yeah. In fact, changing mindset takes a, lo a lot of time. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we wish you luck in that area. Thank you. Another concern is the um, employability of graduates. I know here in Sudan you have more females enrolled in higher education than males. Where do you place them? This is very true. Um, this is now across the country. I think in every university, there are ex uh, the, the only exception are two, are two universities, which are completely for females. So those are hundred hundred okay. percent. The others are between sixty to seventy percent, mm -hmm. and there, there's higher percentage in some classes as okay. well, uh, like in pharmacy. But there will be le less percentage of females in engineering, for example. Mm -hmm. That has created some employment issues because uh, quite often female graduates will not want to go to some of the remote areas of the country. Mm. And uh, that created some, some difficulty for employers and for the government, in particular for doctors, for nurses, and that uh, they prefer to work, a lot of them work to prefer to in work in cities. Khartoum or big cities. Onduman, yes. Shendi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. and the, yeah, and less and less in smaller places. Okay. But having said that, you, you run an equitable examination system and you cannot uh, discriminate against them. So, so the, uh, the intake depends on the pass rate in the, in the Sudan school certificate and it is much higher among females than yeah, among yeah. males. Another yeah. major concern yeah. is that now we are in a knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence yeah. is competing with human labor to do jobs. Yeah. Is this a concern in Sudan? Well, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, if, if you look at America now, America is the most advanced and probably most automated country. Having said that, they have one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in the world. Mm. Uh, unemployment rate in America is about 4% four, four at the moment. So it is not the countries which are technically most developed, which are having <laughs> employability problems. It's the other way around. In Africa, it's just because we are not developed enough. I'm sure if we, we develop and the economy expanded enough, uh, so far this should not lead to the current high rate of unemployment in Africa. Uh, and even you mentioned earlier a lot of this companies, Chinese companies, when they come here, uh, they even they employ even the unskilled workers, they bring them from, from China. China. And, and that doesn't help the country training its so, so own workforce yeah. and that. So no, this, the, this youth in Africa should constitute a tremendous demographic advantage for Africa. Because people in the West now, are recruiting workers from outside. People in Europe are recruiting workers from outside. Here in Africa, we have these young people, and instead of being an asset for the economy, they, they are a liability at the moment. No, prof, because they, of they are liability work. because higher education should yes. be training these youth. Currently, yeah. our population is about one million, mm -hmm. but the higher education participation rate is about 8%. The global average is 37%. Is it, is it not the situation that higher education is not really up to its um, a mantle of training enough youth? 
to pick up, you know, right, well, and play well, right. Use. But uh, I think uh, we should be careful not to put the cart before the horse. Okay. Because uh, the way I see it is that from colonial times onwards, higher education should develop in proportion to the development of the of the country, country. of the society. Yes. Because if you just think that, oh, oh and some of some African and Asian countries had that thinking because they say, oh, all these Europeans and Americans, they developed mainly by education. Oh, let us open as many universities. And then a few years' time, we'll be like them. No, it doesn't work like that. We need to leapfrog. Exactly. So higher education should develop. So th this number, we should not be guided by numbers. We, okay. should, we should be guided by the situation on the ground. Mm. Like the, 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 the higher education, which is going to pull our nations out of poverty is high quality, good education. High quality, yes, good education. Yes, because if it's not a matter of certification. No. Uh, education and certification are different. Are different and can start going into different directions. Exactly. And in many countries which thought that just opening more universities, the only thing they achieved was what I uh, can call inflation of education. It's just like economic inflation, mm. okay? And what happened then, that the standards went down, there are more numbers, and even the employers changed their minds because, so for example, some years back, an employer would say, oh, a higher school certificate is good enough for me to do a clerical job in, in, in a bank. But then, because there are so many graduates, then people say, no, if, well, if there are so many graduates, I'm not going to take uh, school <laughs> leavers. Mm. I will only take university graduates. Yeah. And then there are so many university graduates who cannot find employment. What do they do? They go and get masters. And then the employers say, oh, if I have so many people with masters, why do I employ people with bachelor qualifications? Exactly. <laughs> so they go and employ people with masters. And then, so you, 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 you are creating this, and you are not really thinking about, uh, are you achieving value in yeah. this? Yeah. Uh, or is it just, yeah, you like, you, you, you are satisfying numbers mm. and percentages, yeah. that you are happy, oh, now so, so much percentage of your population are in universities. Mm. So I would like to, to look at everything through a sustainable development. Yeah, exactly. Because that's the final, the final objective, that's mm. the final aim, mm -hmm. okay? And that has to be measured by its parameters. Mm -hmm. And everything else has to fall into place. But otherwise, the simplistic thinking of if we have more educated people, we're going to have more sustainable development. It didn't work for many that countries. Yeah. So do, do you also blame the curriculum that we, we teach as not bringing out, you know, quality, you know, uh, not university, but academic products? For instance, some programs do not even send their children out for internship. Uh, so they, they, or not the children, but the students. So they just pass through the university instead of the university passing through them. This is very true uh, because uh, the curriculum is, is a map which takes a student from position A to position B. Right. Uh, and so it has to be good. It's execution and monitoring, evaluation, and positive feedback and all that has to be ingrained in the execution of the curriculum. Uh, and one of the, our problems is that we have mummified curricula quite often, mm. okay? Uh, so a curriculum is a, is a living organism. It should be Yeah, which a has living. to be, exactly, it should, well, it should be. It should be. And that will happen. Because now, if, if you look about the critique of higher education, yeah. if you read some American or British or French educationalists criticizing their education system, uh, if people tell you, if, you, if people just g give you the text and they don't tell you which education system these people are talking about, mm. you would say, oh, it must be a country in Africa. Mm. But then you discover it in the U.S. People are so critical yeah. of everything. And, and you come to Africa quite often and people are so content. 
<laughs> with what they have. Yes. Okay? Mm. Uh, and this is why I say people always need a link mm -hmm. with higher education in the developed world. Yeah. Because they should look at... Uh, and then the other thing is that like higher education is not separable from the rest of the society. Okay. So societies which are developed where there is a lot of rational thinking, where there is a lot of scientific approach to things, mm -hmm. a lot of, there is a lot of debate and, and, and a culture of debate, uh, and, and you have lively political institutions, uh, strong civil society organizations, yeah. a lot of ambition, and they have a benchmark because if you live in Germany or in Britain or in America, you have a, a benchmark from the developed world. Here in Africa, we don't seem to have that. But should okay. Africa have so its own specific benchmark? We don't. We don't. There isn't, honestly, because people sometimes look at the developed countries and some people will say, oh, no, please don't. We can't. You, 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 it's unfair to do this comparison. But then for us in Africa, we don't even have sufficient engagement and interaction between our academic institutions to Prof. actually to agree on a, such a We benchmark. will come to that collaboration. Yeah. But viewers, we are having a very interesting engagement with Professor Said, who is the president of Sudan International University, a private university here in Sudan, and he is also a board member of the Association of African Universities. Please, let's take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about collaboration in higher education. The University of Khartoum is the oldest university in Sudan. It has a lot of faculties and this includes the science faculty. The science faculty has a lot of facilities and among them is the Microbial Culture Collection Unit, MCCU. The MCCU has two subunits, namely the Molecular Biology and the Microbiology Units. The Microbiology Unit consists of the Culture Room and the Microbiology Lab. The microbiology lab is well equipped with state-of-the-art facilities to conduct analysis on bacteria and other microbes. The bacteria are then sent to the culture room for incubation based on two temperatures, that is the cold and the room temperature. There is also a freeze dryer that converts bacteria into powdery forms to be stored over time. The molecular biology unit is where DNAs are extracted using equipment such as microwaves. Other facilities of the unit include a sterilization room where all equipment used in the unit are sterilized. It is also where the microbes used in the various experiments are killed. A cold room where samples such as DNA and media are kept as well as a meeting room where seminars and experiments are done. Welcome back viewers. I'm having a very interesting talk with Professor Said, who is president of Sudan International University. Prof, before the break, we were talking about collaboration, and you had mentioned that African universities don't have strong collaboration. We were also talking about benchmarking. We're using Europe, America as mm -hmm. benchmark. Can you be more specific on collaboration between and among African universities in the spirit of South-South cooperation. Yeah, when I was talking about it, I, I put it in, like there is even a political, if you look, we look at Europe, for example, America or Australia and New Zealand, uh, these people, they consider themselves, they come from, they belong mm -hmm. to the same block. cultural block, cultural philosophy and yeah. all that. Yeah. And an individual who lives in the UK uh, expects to have similar education and health care and everything to anybody who lives in Germany or in the US or in Australia and all that. Mm. And so, uh, and there is a lot of like uh, exchange. Uh, if you look at academic conferences, for example, they are taken very seriously. People from Europe go regularly to the state. They attend academic conferences in Australia and New Zealand. Different research groups are interacting all the time. Mm. People physically go from one country to work in the other country, not, not in, in all walks of life. Okay. Remember, the governor of the Bank of England is not English, he's Canadian. Again. Exactly. So it is, it, it is the bank which determined the most powerful and important tool in economy, which is the interest rate. Exactly. And that is led by a non-British person. 
And if you go there and you find in many places university vice chancellors who are non-British. Yeah. If you go to America, you'll find Scandinavians there at the top or Indians or whatever. If you go to Australia, and so this culture provides them with this benchmark in all walks of life. Now, in Africa, even some of the collaboration we had in the past in this region is no longer here because things don't, like, we don't build on what we have. Years back, when I was a young lecturer here at the University of Khartoum, after returning Prof, from... don't you think the problem is that African universities are competing among themselves? Maybe, for instance, Faculty of Engineering in SIU seems to be competing with the Faculty of Engineering in U of K. Well, to be honest, uh, even like uh, uh, I competition itself requires like excellence. Like if I live in isolation, uh, after a while I cannot compete very well. So even for me to be more competitive, I need to be to know what is going on outside my university, outside my continent, outside my region, my continent, even outside my, uh, in the rest of the world. I have to sharpen my competitive edge by knowing what other people are doing and how can I do it better than them. So well, collaboration well, does not mean at all okay. you, you give your competitive elements to the others. Mm. But in collaboration, you can both benefit from a collaboration and you can still remain competitive. Mm. And that's what happens in the West. For example, uh, European countries okay. are very interested in overseas students. Yes. That can a very important source of income for, for, them. for them, for the universities. Yeah. But if you go now for a university in Britain, for example, you might find a research group which is doing research work with a group in Germany, or in Hungary, or in Australia, yeah. or in America, all that. Because if they limit themselves to their group, they are less likely to achieve a breakthrough. Yeah. Okay, so you put resources together. Now, a breakthrough will strong both organization, will strengthen Strending both organizations. Okay. So that's the way people look at it. So mm. people do not allow this uh, presumed competitiveness to stand in their way. So you can build your strength and you can build your competitiveness that way. So if, you, if, if I have University of London, a group there collaborating with University of Hamburg, and when they have a breakthrough, it is better for the two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think that's important. But he, here, for example, I tell you, when I was at the University of Khartoum, we used to have visiting lecturers going from here uh, to Uganda, mm -hmm. to Ethiopia, mm -hmm. to teach. Okay. Uh, and then we get people from there, from McCrary. What kind of here. a staff exchange? For example. Okay. It, that's not happening now. No, so who should be responsible for this? Well, that's a good, because uh, it's a good question. I, I, this is one of the things I mentioned in one of the board meetings. How can we, as AAU, actually encourage? Uh, let us start, start within the region. Because Ethiopia, like Addis Ababa, is one and a half hour flight from Khartoum. Yes. Gondar University, which is at the borders, you can drive by car mm. and reach there in a few hours okay. in Ethiopia. Mm. Uh, it's like, likewise, from here to Cairo, it is two hours by air. From here to N'Djamena. So these countries are so close, okay? Mm. Uh, and uh, even from Kampala to, to, to Khartoum, it's not a long journey, mm. okay, or from Toronto. Dar es Salaam or mm. something like this. Uh, so this has been going on, but it stopped because there was no support for it. Is it a political will, the African Union, or it should be an educational body like the AAU that should be responsible? Uh, I, th I think the AAU can start the initiative. It will require some funding to get it going. Mm. And that's where the African Union can come in yeah. to, to support this and uh, not just teaching, but but even exchange of credit between the different universities. Okay. Collaboration in postgraduate education is extremely important mm. uh, because many universities don't have sufficient uh, resources to, have, to offer good postgraduate. 
was great education collaboration and research yeah. a lot of yeah. a lot of uh, similar problems all over africa they even join problems for example with us and chad or ethiopia or, or egypt or eritrea or uh, central african republic that are open borders I, even like uh, the animal diseases are shared, they are transferred across the border. Exactly. People walk across the border well, in each direction day, freely yeah. and all that. So there's a, a lot of uh, reason for this collaboration to start on. Uh, and I hope, I mean, I don't know, I will continue to preach this and try to see if one day we can get, even if we can get a pilot project running in one of the regions. Yeah. And uh, I know in the field of agriculture, there is a, a body called Roof Forum that is trying to bring together uh, many of the agricultural universities. So that is just a start. And I, I attended the last uh, symposium in Accra and I was quite impressed okay. by what they are doing. Okay. And I think they are setting an example for, for, for other, other people to follow. Okay. Yes. Mm. AU has been doing some staff exchange, but it's very limited because of funding. Yes. Yeah, so maybe in the regional, in the Eastern African region, the yeah. you may start from the regional office to see how you can collaborate on programs. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I mean, I hope uh, when we meet uh, uh, in a couple of months' time in Cairo, the board I The mean, board meets in Cairo. Uh, okay. I, will, we'll, I will think about... Uh, Again, putting my proposal on the table again and see what can come out of it because it was it was very good in many ways when it was happening actually yeah. uh, I, I I was taught by when I was a university student here by people from different at that time from f far from the u s from from the u k the economy was okay at that time, so okay. it wasn't too expensive for universities to ask for visiting professors yeah. to come. Now it is not the case, but at least we can afford people traveling in the region, I think. Okay. Before we, we finally wrap up, there's something that is very dear to higher education, and that is research. Mm. You, know, you have spoken a lot about collaboration, and you've mentioned research several times. One problem with African research is that we are not mostly cited in high-impact journals. Mm -hmm. So African research is about less than 5% of the global research output. What mm. can be done? Well, uh, this is a very important topic. And uh, honestly, the state of research in Africa is not good. And uh, what is being done as well is not up to the, 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 the size of the problem, with the exception of now these centers of excellence, which are funded by the World Bank. Mm -hmm. um, I was on, on one of the teams which reviewed the performance of some of these centers. Okay. And we reviewed some of the proposals. And some of these centers have done very good work. And they achieved high quality research. And they managed to publish in, in high quality journals. Uh, some of the proposals are, well, Modest to to, yeah, to, to at least to, to be uh, to be charitable, <laughs> a, uh, very charitable. I think yes. calling them modest, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and it's a big it's a big problem. Yeah. And even if you look at the Asian countries, which have achieved a lot of economic development, they are working at improving their research potential a lot a lot more than us in Africa. Yeah. I went to Malaysia to the University of Malaya, the largest university in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Jasmine, and he said to me, do you know who was sitting in your chair yesterday? I said, I don't know. He said, it was the Chinese Prime Minister. Wow. And he <laughs> said, he came from Beijing. Mm -hmm. He came to see me here before he traveled to Petrajaya, the capital, to see our Prime Minister. Really? Yeah, because he said, we in Asia, we have achieved a lot of economic development yeah. by collaborating with American and Western European companies. Okay. But we are still lagging back in basic research and generating of new innovative ideas. Mm. And now, what the Chinese are trying to do is to amass 
all the resources we have in Southeast Asia. Okay. And we, ha we need to really have a good goal at improving our ability at basic innovative research. Okay. And this is why they started this Shanghai, actually, ranking system. Yes. They, didn't, they, they were not interested in ranking. In the ranking. No, they, they are interested in uh, having a, a measure of the difference between their universities and the elitist universities in the world. Okay. Okay, like... Uh, uh, Oxford. Uh, like Oxford, like you know, John Hopkins, like uh, Stanford and Harvard and yeah. uh, MIT and, and that, okay? Uh, to their university. This is the main objective of okay. starting this ranking. Mm. And they are very honest in their ranking. They don't like uh, overinflate their ranking because okay. they are interested in narrowing this the gap. gap. Mm. So this is one of the measures. Mm. And here we, we, were, we are just so self-congratulatory quite often <laughs> and, uh, and say, oh no, we're we are okay, we're doing but this and that. But what you've said is true. Prof. There's a lot of work needs doing. Prof, but don't you think that research is skewed towards the African scholar? Because uh, for instance, I have noticed that we don't patent a lot. Maybe it's because of collaboration and we don't know how to negotiate, you know, to, to have patenting as part of the qualification mm -hmm. or part of the promotion processes. So we always rush and then give out our research you know, results and then at the end of the day, we, we are not even cited. Is that not an African problem? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, because a lot of a lot of groups which are working in America and Europe, they they look with a lot of suspicion at uh, a lot of the research which comes out from outside those areas, and so they very rarely cite them. And to be honest, for uh, I wouldn't say it's not for a reason because uh, there is a lot of research which is done in our countries, mm -hmm. which does not adhere very strictly to strict methodologies. Okay. Uh, uh, the the follow-up by supervisors might not be very, very adequate. Uh, there is uh, the, the shortage of resources might uh, put okay. pressure on the researchers to cut corners uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it is very, and this is why uh, a lot of the research which we produce in Africa is not viewed uh, very seriously by many research groups in, in Western countries. And uh, it, it's a shame because uh, even our problems now are still being solved by, by research groups in Europe and America. If you look at tropical diseases, yes. they don't have them. They don't. We have them. Yes. But who's always coming up with new medications it's or with new diagnostic methods? Yeah. They're coming from America and yeah, Europe. Probably. They're not coming from us. So should Africa look inward? They, 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 they look in all, but they, they need the tool and they, not, they need the link with developed centers in the West so that they can sharpen their research tools and they can, they can ad adhere to a research governance schemes, yes. okay. Okay, which ensure the quality of the results they produce. Okay. Prof, it's been very exciting talking to you. Thank you very much. I wish you could go on and on and on and on because you have a wealth of knowledge you want to share with the world. Thanks. But Thank so you very soon, much. they say a good conversation never ends. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So we should come to the end of this very lively conversation. Viewers, I've been talking to Professor Osman Said, who is the president of Sudan International Universities. We are talking everything higher education. Professor, before we finally wrap up, what will be your last words of advice to the higher education community in Africa? Well, my advice which I give to usually an individual, a young people who come to me here and they are just at the beginning of the academic ladder and they said to me, oh, I want to this and I want to do, do that, but you know, there are no resources but, and this and the salary I'm getting is, and I said to them, there is one track you can take, which is going to build your academic career. And there are so many other tracks which lead to all areas of wilderness, yes. academic wilderness, okay? So when I went to do my PhD in the UK, the first thing my supervisor said to me, how much research did you do? Mm. 
I said, uh, none. <laughs> he said, why? Yes. I said, because in Sudan, we don't have much resources. He said, doing research has nothing to do with resources. You can do research on a piece of a straw. Research is the way of finding facts. And you can do that. You don't need resources to do that. The other ones first listen in research. So I said to them, just keep working and you will discover at the end that things work in your favor. Uh, with the resources you have, the most important thing, follow a scientific method. First, do research on what it matters. Either because it's a problem which your community is facing, or it is something which has interested you intellectually, so you want to, you want to know more about it. You have that level of curiosity, okay? Yeah. Then follow it. Mm. Follow your curiosity lead. And that is research, not a matter of big machines or equipment. At the end of the day, yes. In this country, when I came as a young lecturer with other people, we didn't have any money. We applied for many organizations. And initially, we were turned down. Even one of them said, oh, you guys, you seem to have very bright ideas, but we do not believe that you have sufficient expertise in Sudan mm. to be able to explore them properly. Okay? And then, just a couple of years later, we had more than a million dollars in our account doing our research. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, uh, this is what I tell these young people wherever I meet with them. And now when, when we went with the World Bank to these universities, like, I always kept telling people that, okay, you are getting this good money from the World Bank. Put the youth in leadership. Okay. You, you guys, you direct them, but put them in leadership. Put them as leaders in the project, not as... A, a, a workforce okay. doing things at the bench, yes. okay? Uh, and so, so uh, that's the way things should go. Mm. Yeah. Viewers, research is the way of finding facts. Mm. And with these words from Professor Bakri Osman Said, we've come to yet the end of another exciting episode of AAU Talks. Stay tuned in.